Hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. The series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. We're delighted today to be welcoming Jonathan Carr, the Vice President of Research and Environment at the Atlantic Salmon Federation located in St. Andrews, New Brunswick. He has 25 years of research experience in the management, restoration, and conservation of wild fish, including endangered and threatened populations. Jonathan has been published widely and has served in a number of capacities related to fisheries research and policy. Much of his research has focused on the marine ecology and behavior of Atlantic salmon, fish passage at hydro dams, impacts of exotic species, stock assessment, and interactions between wild and escaped farmed salmon. After the presentation, we'll be opening the floor for a question and answer session, and you'll have the option of either asking questions directly using your microphone or you can type them in and we'll read them aloud. I will now turn the webinar over to Jonathan. Thank you, Darla. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to be talking today on uh, telemetry as a tool for uh, measuring the migration and distribution of uh, Atlantic salmon in the marine environment. I'm going to, here's the outline. I'm going to be talking about what the problem is and uh, salmon telemetry in the ocean, why now? And uh, get into some, then go into some of the case studies that the ASF and our many partners have been involved with, particularly acoustic telemetry and satellite telemetry. And then wrap things up as to where do we go from here? What's next? So the North American Atlantic salmon abundance has been stuck at historically low levels for several decades now. Uh, we've gone from smolt to, adult, re smolt to adult returns of range of 7 to 20 percent in those decades earlier to now really between 3 to 4 percent smolt to adult return rates. There's several different hypotheses through freshwater, estuarine, and, and, and at sea as to what the problems could be. Uh, there's a paper by uh, David Cairns back in uh, the early 2000s where a group of researchers identified more than 63 different hypotheses. Um, and recently, last fall, the Atlantic Salmon um, Joint Venture had a, had a meeting and, and several scientists, some of the same ones that were at that work, workshop back in the 2000s and many new ones, reviewed some of those uh, hypotheses and really a lot of those are still outstanding um, even today, uh, almost two decades later. Now our area of research is in the uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence region and the rivers that we're focusing on have uh, quite a stable juvenile salmon population. Really the, uh, the uh, densities are relatively healthy in the rivers that we're studying. So this points to the problem in the ocean. And the focus of our research has been to track that problem. So telemetry, why now? Well, there's been some massive technological advances over the past few decades, which has led to substantial infrastructure. For instance, when, when I started tagging fish back in the early 1990s, we used the uh, a, a unit called a VR60, which is the equivalent of a VR100 uh, mobile unit that people tend to carry around with them in boats today. They attach a hydrophone cable to it. Um, that's what we had for tracking device back in the early 90s. So if we wanted to track fish in the river at fixed positions, we would put this unit in a cooler, place two large car batteries, take it out in the middle of the woods, and then run our hydrophone cable out into the middle of the river and attach it to a rebar and have to go back every two days to download the batteries. So really, the advancement in the technology has really skyrocketed over the past few decades, not only in the uh, receiver infrastructure, but also in the size of tags and the battery life on tags. And this has led to more and more people tagging salmon, and not only salmon, but other species, which increases collaborations, new initiatives, and multi-species benefits. Here's a couple of graphics just showing the uh, advancement in tech, um, telemetry over the past few decades, both with acoustic and satellites. And you can see with acoustics really took off in the mid-2000s. Satellites, uh, particularly for salmon, was around that time as well. And here's a snapshot just where uh, uh, the uh, telemetry inventory is 
situated globally now for both acoustic and satellite data. So now getting into our studies, what we wanted to do was sonically take smolts from a south to north cline of rivers and follow their movements and survival through fresh water out to sea as far as possible. Basically, you start to develop those migration paths. Where are the fish going? Where are they dying? We've also evolved to track other life stages. Um, for instance, we're, we're also taking salmon kelts. These are adult salmon that would have spawned in late October, early November, over winter under the ice, and uh, migrate to sea the following spring. Uh, where they recondition and then they come back and can spawn multiple times. Other names for Celts are black salmon or slinks. Tracking isn't easy. There's a lot of challenges that, that come about with respect to telemetry. It's a big ocean. The further you go afield from the shoreline, the more logistically challenging it is to put receiver gates and arrays out there. You've got limited transmitter and receiver ranges. Typically, the uh, uh, transmitter range, detection range on the uh, tags that we're using uh, is about 800 meters and that's on a good day. The uh, cap capital cost of equipment is quite high and there's a uh, labor cost as, as well. So we tend to deploy our units seasonally so we have to put them out every spring and re retrieve them later in the summer, early fall. And then comes um, figuring out what your information means when you download your data. Um, you have to not only basically figure out where the fish are going, but what does it mean in terms of matching it with environmental variables and uh, predator-prey relations and things like that. And when it comes to data compilation and storage, it's quite massive. We're sitting on close to 10 million detections of, of data within our database. And on any given year, we have about 800,000 uh, detections. So here's our study area located in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Four key rivers, the Cascopedia, the Restigouche, and within the Miramichi, we, we take fish in the northwest branch and in the southwest branch of the Miramichi system. We've, we've tagged over 3,300 3, smolts to date. Um, each of those fish are tagged with, with the uh, tag you can see in the upper left-hand column. Each of them have a unique signal, and those tags last about 110 days. Smolts are collected um, using primarily smolt wheels or rotary screw traps every spring. Uh, when the fish are collected, we anesthetize them and surgically implant the tag in the animal and then release the animal. Similar with kelts, the kelt tags are larger than the smolts. These tags are programmed to last about three to four years. And uh, the kelts are caught uh, by angling in the spring of the year in, in uh, the, the key rivers. The key rivers are the kelts, so the rest of the and the Miramichi. And as I mentioned, there's many, many partners involved in this project, and um, I'm not going to be able to name them all on every slide, but I do want to make point of some of the key partners in the field for our smolt and kelp tracking. Uh, within the Miramichi, the Miramichi Salmon Association are a key partner, along with the First Nation groups in those areas, Cascopedia Society in the First Nations in that area, the rest of Goose River Watershed Management Committee, First Nations in that area as well. And then DFO is highly involved with, with all of these sites as well. And then there's many volunteers and other watershed groups as well. So I just wanted to uh, tip my hat and acknowledge those people that, that are quite active with, within our program. Now, once we tag the fish, we have to have a means of tracking them. So we typically use uh, VR2W receivers. Um, both their tags and receivers are through a company called Vemco Limited. Um, receivers, we, we've advanced the receivers along the way too as, as new models come out. We're now using other types of receivers similar in, in shape as this one, but uh, VR2TXs, VR2ARs, which are acoustic releases and so on. What we want to do is measure survival through fresh water. So we uh, put a gate of receivers at the head of tide in each of the four systems. We measure survival through the estuaries and bays. So we put a gate of receivers at Chalera Bay in Outer Miramichi Bay, and then we want to get a measure of survival out through the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So receivers are placed at the Strait of Belial as well. And you'll notice a second receiver or second line or gate at the uh, Strait of Belial. This is used as a reference point so that we can um, model uh, probability detection on all the inner units, which also helps us uh, define, uh, get, a, get better definitions of survival estimates as well. So that's why we have the second gate there. All the gates that we're operating are seasonal, so we do uh, 
deploy them in the spring and retrieve them midsummer to early fall. And the, the lower exit for, or entrance of the uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence is a cab straight line that's owned and operated by the Ocean Tracking uh, Network based at Dalhousie University. And this is a permanent array. This array is in year round. So one of the, what are the, some of the key lessons we've learned from our smoke tracking? Well, survival rates have been quite high through the fresh water and the key rivers we've been studying. Uh, medians ranged from 80 to 96% over a time series, 96% being for the Cascopedia. And, and these, these fish only have to travel about 10 kilometers from the release point to head a tide. And the lower spectrum is 80% from the Southwest Miramichi. These fish have the longest distance to migrate upon release. They have to travel about 130 kilometers from the point of release to the head of tide. Survival rates to the estuaries and bays become more variable. Uh, for instance, the uh, median for Schiller Bay has been uh, 68 to 76 percent for the for the Arrestigouche and Cascopedia systems over a time series. Miramichi Bay uh, for northwest and southwest Miramichi smolts was quite similar to these numbers um, in the early days, right up until around 2010. Slightly lower, but pretty close to this number. Since 2010, things changed dramatically in the Miramichi Bay. Over the last four years, it's been much of a reversal. We're now looking at only 30 to 35 percent survival of smolts um, annually through the Miramichi Bay system. And we can attribute a lot of that to predation by striped bass. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on in the presentation. Now, survival out through the Gulf can be quite variable, but what we do find is there's annual trends. Um, are similar among rivers and across stocks from year to year. So in some years, the survival has been quite high. Other years, it's been more variable. And I think a lot of that accounts um, can be traced back to water temperature and food availability within the Gulf as, as those fish move through that zone. Another thing we found, as you can see in the upper left-hand graph, is that the exit route, primary exit route through the Gulf of St. Lawrence, is via the Strait of Belisle. Um, we're taking fish from from different rivers, not only the fish from the four key rivers we're tagging, but other researchers. For instance, you can see one going off of Cape Breton. There's been fish tagged in the Bordeaux Lakes, uh, Marguerite River, and, and also on Prince Edward Island, and even Fort Toe, Quebec. These fish all are traveling through the Strait of Belal relatively over the same time period every year, which is quite interesting because, for instance, with, with our program, we're tagging Miramichi smolts. Um, often four weeks in advance of those in the Cascopedia system. So, but, but these fish appear to be congregating somewhere in the Gulf and moving through um, over their short time window. We've only had two detections of the Cabot Strait over a time series, uh, one from the Cascopedia, one from the Miramichi, and uh, we're not sure if they went through the Cabot Strait or, or they were just brushing that as they went up through the Gulf. Here's an example of movements of fish through the Strait of Belisle. Focus on the uh, bottom graphic first. Um, you can see the post smolts, the timing of post smolt migration. Uh, quite a nice fit for a bell bell shaped curve here for the, not only the fish we've been taking, but some of our other researchers. Uh, for this particular year, 2016, you can see fish from the Matapedia and, and Prince Edward Island as well. And again, fish move through over tight window, usually over about a 10 day period each July. Some years that bell curve has shifted a little bit to the left, some years a little bit to the right, but you still have that tight window of movement. The upper graph, you can see kelp movements through the uh, Strait of Belisle. Kelp tend to start moving through the strait um, a few weeks in advance of the smolt, but there are a few kelps that do overlap with, with timing of smolt migration as well on a year-by-year -year basis. Moving on to uh, kelp tracking now, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, pop-up tags because with the acoustic tags we're getting uh, information on regional assessments, basically survival through fresh water, through estuaries and bays in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. But with, with the uh, pop-up tags we can begin to get finer scale movement locations and begin to understand where mortalities are occurring and in some cases identify murder suspects or the predators that are involved. And uh, there's a paper that came out on this about a year ago, and you can see the reference at the bottom of the screen. Basically, this is this is what we get from from a good track. 
Um, you can see the yellow is, is where a fish was released in the Miramichi system. And then the daily tracks, coloration, uh, cor correspond to the month on the side here. The wider circles represent deeper depths that these fish were diving on particular days. And this uh, tag actually popped off at the prescribed date, September 30th, about 200 kilometers north of Nook in Greenland. So as you can see, finer scale movement and location of, of fish using these type of tags. Here's how they work. We uh, strap the tag onto the back of the animal. It records water temperature, water depth, sunrise and sunset times, so that that will give us our geopositioning data. And then we program the tag to pop off at a prescribed date. If that fish happens to die before the prescribed date, there's a mechanism that will allow detachment of the tag from, from the animal, goes to the surface, and that's when we start getting information in real time to the satellites, in turn, to our computers, uh, all the valuable information from that fish. What about predation events? Here's, here's a, a snapshot of a typical graph you would get where we have a predation event. Um, bottom axis time, this fish was tagged on um, about April the 20th, focusing on the Y2 axis. You can see the water temperature, with, this is in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, was hovering between five and 10 degrees Celsius, which is what you would expect in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, until around June the 20th, the water temperature spiked to between 20 and 25 degrees for about a seven day period. Going to the Y1 axis, you get the depth, and uh, the salmon was what you would expect again in the upper 10 meters of the water column until that magic date of June the 20th, where it started making deep dives, um, 80 meters, and this is in the bottom of the uh, gulf in that particular zone. And then the tag is expelled and starts transmitting its data to the surface. Quite certain this fish was consumed by poor beagle shark based on the uh, the uh, behavioral profile from the water temperature and water depth information. This tag was ingested or the salmon was ingested by the shark, stayed in the body for up to seven days, and then most likely was regurgitated and to the surface it came. Now I showed on a couple slides earlier uh, a reference for a paper that, that we put out on the uh, movements of uh, pop-up tags fish from the, from the Miramichi system. Primary author on that was uh, Jan Strom, a, a PhD student we had visiting with us from Norway, from the University of Tromso. He's now working on um, quantifying mortality of PSAT tag salmon, trying to identify the most likely predators and assess the geographical distribution of predation events. As you can see from this graphic, he's not only using our data from North America, but he's also incorporating information from five other countries. And um, what he's found is that out of all the tag fish, out of all the fish that have been tagged over the past half dozen years or more, I think about 150 fish were tagged in all, 15% can be attributed to predation events. And you can see the uh, in the key over here, ectotherms, endotherms, mammals, and unknowns, he's starting to identify and key out areas where those types of uh, predators had consumed um, Atlantic salmon. Now this paper um, is gonna be out later this year we expect it to be so more information stay tuned on that one i just want to wrap up the, the pop-up tags um, with with this 3d graphic we're going to see two fish leaving the rest of goosh one in red one in yellow these fish are tagged late april early may and when they go out into the gulf they tend to spend about a month and a half until mid-june feeding in the gulf a lot of that feeding occurs in around anticosti island some of it down around pei as well by mid-june these fish either turn around and come back to the river of origin where they'll spawn as consecutive spawners, or presumably they don't have enough energy reserves so they'll turn around or continue moving out through the Gulf of St. Lawrence and into Labrador Sea. You can see the yellow triangle fish that died just before the Strait of Belisle. That fish was eaten by a poor beagle shark. This other one continued on into Labrador Sea. And from our tagged information, we're finding about half the fish are hugging the Labrador shelf, the, the light color blue, um, and the other half are actually going out into the trench. I call it the deep abyss, which can be up to a little over two kilometers depth. These fish out in this zone, um, we've had dives up to 900 meters in this particular zone, which we find is quite outstanding. And that fish died right around that area there. 
Now what you can see from this graph is that we're getting detailed information as to where these fish are going on a daily basis and starting to map out the movement and behavior of these fish. The next step is to start homing in on some of the areas where these fish are spending more time and, and relating that to environmental variables and, and uh, prey and predator abundance and so on. So in summary, what have we learned from kelp tracking? Well, survival rates to the estuary and bay are quite high. All the kelps are tagged in the estuaries as they leave the system, by the way. Once they get out in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, they're finding mortality is quite high for these tagged kelps. And uh, the inter interesting thing we're finding is these kelps that actually spend uh, one year out in the ocean, termed alternate year spawners, they all make their way out through the Strait of Belial. But upon return, to the rivers, most of them are actually coming around the southeast side of Newfoundland and back through the Cabot Strait to the home rivers. I mentioned this earlier, kelps migrate both within and off the continental shelf. We also found that the daily vertical dives are in the range of 10 to 30 meters. That's within the Gulf of St. Lawrence and on the shelf, presumably feeding. And then I mentioned that on the earlier slide, dives up to 900 meters. So what are some of the key take-home messages from the smolt and kelp tracking so far? Well, as I mentioned earlier, survival rates of the freshwater are quite high. Survival rates in the estuary and the ocean generally lower and become more variable. Narrowed and defined spatial and temporal windows, which is important for uh, input data for marine modelers, and also important for localized marine spatial planning. We're starting to identify complex and dynamic migration routes, which are relatively narrow in time and space. And another thing we found too, we, we put what we call ocean drifters out a few years ago, uh, testing the hypotheses that these fish will actually migrate or drift with the currents when in the Gulf. And we expelled that hypothesis because the uh, fish are moving, the ocean current, these drifters only moved about a third as fast as the salmon in the Gulf. The uh, post smolts in the Gulf were moving, ranged from about 17 to 23 kilometers per day. So they're actually really moving against the currents. I want to switch gears for a few minutes and talk about predator-prey interactions, specifically interactions between striped bass and Atlantic salmon smolt in the Miramichi system. I mentioned earlier on that, uh, or I showed earlier on that the uh, survival of smolts to the Miramichi estuary and bay have dropped significantly since uh, around 2011, 2012. At the same time, the striped bass population was really ballooning, and I'm going to show that in the next slide or so. So I'm going to go over um, this particular paper, and this was published uh, last month in the Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aqu Aquatic Sciences. You can see the reference on the screen here. Um, and I, I believe Daryl is going to be taping this, this presentation, so if you're jotting notes, you can sort of sit back and, and, and relax and, and review this later on if you want. A little bit of background on striped bass in the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence. The uh, natural range of striped bass extends along the Atlantic coast of North America, pretty well from the St. Lawrence estuary all the way down to northeast Florida. And there's different population segments all the way along the way. Um, the southern Gulf segment, which you can see in red here, is different than that of the Bay of Funday and, and the American ones. So the point I want to make is there, there's no evidence of mixing of these southern striped bass populations with those in the Gulf. There was a uh, uh, population of striped bass in the St. Lawrence estuary up until the mid-1960s, but that has since been extirpated. But just as, an, as a side note, uh, juveniles have been trans transferred from the, uh, uh, this region over to the uh, St. Lawrence estuary region, I think beginning in 2013-14, and, and, and that population, or there's bass recolonizing in that area now. What's unique about the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence population of striped bass is that these fish all spawn in a very small section of the northwest branch of the Miramichi River, a section of river that's about 10 kilometers or less. What happens is mature bass congregate in the Miramichi Bay and estuary beginning late September, early October every year, overwinter under the ice, and then they spawn late May through early June, and then they disperse through the Gulf. Here's a graphic showing uh, estimates of 
spawner abundance within the Miramichi system over time. And a lot of variability on this graph, but the take home message here is that in the mid 90s, early 2000s, the striped bass spawning population crashed to between 2,000 and 5,000 spawners. This led DFO or regulators to um, close commercial and recreational fisheries. The good news story here is that these striped bass rebounded quite quickly. By 2011, the populations were really ballooning. And by 2016, the estimated population was close to 318,000 striped bass. And these are spawners, again, in the Miramichi system. Now turning to smolts. This is a graphic showing uh, smolt survival um, through the southwest and northwest Miramichi system from 2003 to 2016. The uh, pink bars represent survival, pink boxes represent survival to head of tide, the green box plots survival to Utter Bay, and then the blue is survival through the Gulf of St. Lawrence. What I want you to see here is in the northwest, the survival to the Utter Bay uh, from 2003 to about 2008 was hovering around 70%, and southwest Miramichi survival is hovering in the high 60s from 2003 to about 2010. Since that time, you can see a downward trend in survival of southwest Miramichi smolts up through the Outer Bay. And in the northwest Miramichi, unfortunately, bat, or smolts were not tagged from 2009 to 2012. But when we picked up tagging again in 2013, we saw the survival uh, drop from the 70% in the early years to now closer to 30%. And this drop is consistent with the increase in striped bass abundance in that zone. So we collaborated with the Quebec government, Fisheries and Oceans, and Miramichi Salmon Association on a project to quantify the predator-prey interactions among Atlantic salmon and striped bass in the Miramichi system from 2013 to 16. Uh, the governments, they, they tagged striped bass both in the Miramichi uh, estuary and bay and also in the Gaspé region of Quebec. And ASF and MSA tagged 515 smolts over that time period in the northwest and southwest branches of the Miramichi. Here's a typical movement pattern for a salmon smolt leaving the Miramichi system. Uh, you've got your time zone on the x-axis, y-axis here is river kilometers. Um, just to give you a point of reference, between the 65 and 70, that's uh, head of tide in the Miramichi. Zero is outer bay in the Miramichi. So typical smolt movement, commonly a straight straight line, relatively straight line down through the system. Here's your typical movement pattern of striped bass, a spawning striped bass in the Miramichi system over the same time period. And you can see just below head of tide in the estuary, this flat line represents when these bass are spawning. Now you see a tag that was put inside a smolt, but now it looks very much like a striped bass. So what we did was we developed a model to generate variables that capture the difference between the two movement behaviors of salmon smolts and striped bass. Uh, a surviving or a true smolt was a fish that was actually detected at the Strait of Belial line, so we could confidently say that this is most likely a smolt and not in a predator. And then we put a lot of other variables into the model, things such as uh, the number of reversals within the Miramichi estuary and bay total up and downstream distance traveled, time on the spawning grounds for striped bass, days in the system between the fish species, and speed through the system, and so on and so on. And that model generated um, consumption events or predation events for um, salmon by striped bass. And this is what we found. In the Northwest, over the four-year period, the uh, predation summary, fish that, salmon smolts that were indeed eaten by striped bass ranged from 99% to 18%. In the southwest, it ranged from 2 to 17%. So quite variable, quite low, but quite high in some years as well. Basically, it provides an index of striped bass predation to drive mortality within the system. It also provides a method to non-subjectively remove bias data. What I mean by that is when researchers are coming up with survival estimates, for salmon or other fish species, you have to take into account whether or not this is indeed the fish that you originally tagged. 
And by this predation project uh, study that we did on the Miramichi, we're starting to remove that bias data, starting to tease out what we know are predators versus non-predators, what are abnormal movements versus normal movements. And we also want to do this in the other systems as well so that we can uh, remove any bias data from our survival estimates. And the results from the study hopefully inform federal fisheries managers for decision-making process regarding management plans, future management plans for the striped bass. So where do we go from here? What's next? We want to continue our domestic nearshore efforts. So we've got the three circles to the left there, which include four rivers. There's a number of other partners or researchers that are tagging fish in different regions of, of uh, eastern North America, both in the U.S. and in Canada. And I'm sure I don't have them all on here, so sorry to those who are listening that have tagged animals in other areas. We also know that the Europeans are becoming more involved um, recent years with uh, tagging fish through estuaries and coastal zones. You can see back in North America here, we're expanding our tagging program uh, alongside of Department of Fisheries and Oceans to pick up a river in Labrador, Lake Melville region, and along with DFO, um, a river in Newfoundland too, most likely Western Arm Brook beginning in 2018. The next thing we want to do is we've been able to track these fish really in the, in the domestic or nearshore efforts for the first two months, coastally out to where they enter Labrador Sea. The next big step is tracking the animals further out to sea. And this is, this is going to be very difficult because it's, it's going to be hard to come up with your survival estimates, partitioning survival. We're really going to have to start focusing basically on temporal and spatial information as, as the fish move out into these larger zones. And um, uh, the Atlantic Salmon Research Joint Venture recently sponsored a telemetry workshop in December where they brought Europeans and, and North Americans together to talk about strategies for, for advancing uh, tracking into the ocean with particular focus on the Labrador Sea and at Greenland. And one of the outcomes of that workshop was a lot more R&D needs to take place before we can start to build a huge program in Labrador Sea when it comes especially to uh, advances in, in tag technology and also receivers and how you deploy and receive and uh, retrieve those units out in the ocean and, and uh, what kind of a strategy do you want to have in place for putting those units in the ocean. One of the other outcomes of this workshop was we don't want to just sit down and wait until those uh, advances in development take place. We need to start somewhere. So in 2017, DFO and ASF started to put a fixed line off of Labrador. It's about 150 kilometers north of the Strait of Belial. This line goes out about 15 kilometers. We plan to double that line this spring. So it's a start. And, and I think it's important to start projects and, and not just wait until everything's there bef before you go gung-ho because that's how virtually all these other programs began, a little bit at a time. So this is where we're, we're starting to stage uh, the next step for Labrador Sea. Um, another thing, outcome of that workshop in December through the Joint Venture Program was to model movements of, of fish, post smolts and pre-adult salmon within the Labrador Sea along the shelf. Where do, you th where do we think those fish are most likely to be congregating? And when those models are developed, hopefully within the next 12 to 18 months, that will um, direct us as to where we would put receiver units, uh, whether they be lines like you see here in the uh, in the mustard color, or or grids, fixed grids within Labrador Sea. So that's really going to drive the next step as to where we put those units. Another thing we really need to work on is tag technology. The tags we're putting in the animals right now are expiring by mid-September. So we either have to tag a lot more animals at the point of origin and have the tags sleep and turn on at a later time, or which can be quite costly because you're losing a lot of the animals along the way. Or another thing we thought of was could we actually capture fish as they pass through the Strait of Belial? Because we know our tagged animals, other researchers' tagged animals are moving through the Strait of Belial and um, over a very short time period. And if it's the animals we're tagging, you could make the assumption that many, if not most of the fish in the Gulf of St. Lawrence could be passing through over that narrow time period, meaning millions of fish. 
And also, these fish should be a lot larger by the time they go through the Strait of Belial. Instead of being 12 to 15 centimeters at the time when we tag them to smolts, these post smolts should be between 25 and 30 centimeters at that time. So we started reconnaissance in 2017 at the Strait of Belial, uh, testing different capture methodologies. And um, we were able to capture a few fish, not many, because the timing wasn't right. We got there a little bit late last year. But the fish we did capture were within that size range we predicted, between 24 and 28 centimeters. So we're going to be going back again this year in, in, in testing um, modifications to our traps and uh, seeing how many fish we can capture because this provides a great opportunity for tagging larger animals and uh, obviously putting larger tags, longer lasting tags in them. Another thing we want to look at, and again through the joint venture workshop was discussed a lot, was to initiate a, a tracking program off of Greenland. Very little is known about salmon during their second year at sea. And the West Greenland Atlantic Salmon Stock Complex is comprised of Atlantic salmon originating from both Europe and North America. About 25% of the salmon off the west coast of Greenland are of, believed to be of European origin. And uh, during the summer and early fall, these fish are in close proximity to the Greenlandic coast. So we believe there's a good opportunity to start tagging these fish in this region and uh, determine how long they are staying in the coastal zone. What are their migration and dispersal as they feed and before they move back and as they move back to the home rivers. We did some reconnaissance in southern Greenland in 2017. And uh, we landed in the Korkatok region. And this is where this tracking is going to start beginning in 2018. Um, 2018 we're hoping to put about 20 tags, pop-up tags on these animals and expand the program a little bit more uh, in the next three years tagging between 40 and 60 fish just to start collecting that information in that next stage of uh, uh, interstage of survival and life cycle at sea. And just finally, we want to continue to pool, leverage, and obtain the court and coordinate resources to increase spatial coverage, reduce the costs, improve the use of existing technologies, and obviously investigate technological advances. And uh, just before I end, I want to talk about some mobile platforms. These are devices that we can take advantage of, really are supplementary to the fixed arrays that I've spoken about throughout the talk. Um, these are where other researchers are either tagging animals or using different devices that we could essentially tag along. Don't mind the pun on this. And I'll just, I'm just going to really briefly go over these. One is bioprobes, and a lot of this is done out of the uh, Ocean Tracking Network, Dalhousie University. These seals, gray seals, are tagged off of Sable Island with, with bioprobes. You can see a track, tracks of these animals. Here's the numbers of tagged over a... Uh, uh, five-year period. A few of these seals wandered into the Gulf of St. Lawrence after they were tagged. And here's some different detections you can see by the gray seals over the time period. We're obviously interested in landing salmon, smolts, and kelts. 2011, one gray seal wandered into the Gulf that had a bioprobe, and uh, five of our fish were detected, a combination of kelts and smolts. 2012, two seals moved into the area. Again, three of our fish were detected. And in 13, three fish were detected by one gray seal, or three tags, I should say, were detected by one gray seal within the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So really, this bioprobes, tagging gray seals, provide a great opportunity, potential opportunity for, for future research as we move into Labrador Sea, perhaps tagging seals up in that region, and they can act as a, a mobile platform for us. Another example is both wave gliders and slocum gliders. These units are typically put out in the ocean to collect oceanographic information. We can attach receivers onto the use units, and we have through, well, the Ocean Tracking Network has. You can see one example um, in the past few years where there was a mission through the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and it detected four of our fish during that time period from, from uh, late May through early July. Drifters, I mentioned that earlier on in our talk. talk. These uh, have track packs or satellite devices or communicators on them. We've put uh, receivers on these units as well and, and let these units just float out in the ocean. You do have to collect those units in order to get your information back. And platforms of opportunity. Folks from NOAA have been using this for some time. They've been actually utilizing uh, lobster traps, 
with navigational buoys and so on. There's a paper on this you can see or, or reference if you go back to this talk later. So really just to summarize, the objective for our program is to map the spatial and temporal distribution of Atlantic salmon in the marine environment. We need to find out the where. Where are these fish going? We need to develop that track. When we develop that track, as we develop that track, we can begin linking um, that information to predator-prey interactions. We, we've done this in the coastal zones already. You can link it to potential anthropogenic activities, things such as the potential for bycatch in fisheries, and other uh, climate-driven and parameters and ecosystems in general. Because really, this is all about putting the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. So again, thank you for your time. And, and I just want to say telemetry can be a valuable tool for looking at the uh, what's happening in the ocean as we try to uh, unravel this mystery as to what's happening to our salmon at sea. I just want to finish with the final slide here, just showing the number of uh, partners, collaborators, and particularly funder, funding agencies that have helped support this program along the way. Many, many partners, and, and the partners continue to um, um, expand year by year. This is an effort that's a community effort, can't be done by one individual group. And uh, the more people we have working together, the faster it, the faster we'll come to a solution. Thanks for your time, and I'll open the floor to the questions. Pass things back over to Darla. Excellent. Thank you so much, John. It's great to see an overview of the research that's happened to date and also to see what the plans are for the next steps for the program. Thank you so much. So as uh, John mentioned, we'll now open the question and answer period. So you've got a couple of different options if this is the first time that you uh, joined us. Just I'll give a quick overview. Um, so you can ask your question directly to John um, by figuratively raising your hand, uh, which should be a, a little hand icon that you see on your control panel. And I'll unmute your audio so that you can ask it directly. Or you can type in your question um, and I will read it aloud. Um, John would like to request if you are typing in your question or if you're going to be asking it aloud, in addition to uh, your name, if you could let us know what your affiliation is, that would be great. So we'll give folks a few minutes to put in their questions. Um, John, maybe I'll just ask one of my own in the meantime. Um, you had mentioned that you have a huge number of data points that you've uh, accumulated to date. I'm just wondering, just on average, how many would you generally have per, per individual? Ooh, that's a good question, individually. Um, I mentioned we have close to 800 detections a year, and we're taking close to 300 fish a year now. So it would be it would definitely be in, the, in some cases thousands and really Darla, it, it depends on how far a fish actually gets so um, for instance if a fish is moving quite fast through the system there there wouldn't be a, a whole lot of detections as it goes out through um, but if a fish is consumed by a predator or perhaps it's dead in the system then that take and if it dies near one of our receiver arrays then obviously you're going to get a lot more detections because that fish is just sitting there stay just sitting there in the bottom um, course, so yeah. it really depends on the region and where where you're looking. Now, uh, probably the area with the least amount of detections would be at the uh, Strait of Belial, where the fish generally pass through that zone quite quite quickly. There is a little bit of drifting on on the tides at the Strait of Belial, but but the fish are, are moving through some of the narrow choke points uh, faster than than others. So. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a few questions that have come in. Uh, the first question comes from Jason Harasimo, um, who says that he has no affiliations. He's writing in from, and I'm not, I don't think I'll pronounce this correctly, but Pang Near Tongue. Um, so his question is, uh, I apologize if I had missed it, but did you mention the estimated percentage of salmon from the Gulf that migrate to southern Greenland? No, I didn't give the number, Jason, and um, I don't. I don't want to just reach out of the of the year and give you a number. Um, what I can tell you is Greenland. The, the Atlantic salmon from North America that go to Greenland are typically fish that 
are destined to be spending at least two winters in the ocean feeding. Um, any fish that only go out for one year in the ocean, we refer to them as one sea winter or grilts. Those fish from North America will tend to stay more coastal, um, particularly around Labrador Sea in Newfoundland. Those that are going to spend two years or more in the ocean will migrate over to Greenland and spend a few months, quite a few months in that, in that zone. Um, I think there would be numbers out there from um, uh, assessment reports and I uh, can certainly um, find that information and email it to you if, if we can receive your contact information. And perhaps if somebody's listening um, from DFO or who's involved with the, the assessment reports, if they know the number, they could chime in. But if not, I certainly will look that up and um, get back to you, Jason, on that. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Amanda Babin, who has uh, questions from Saint Sam Andrews, um, who is studying striped bass in the St. John River at UNB. Um, so the first question is, did tagged smolts reach the estuary later than the rest of the smolt population? Um. I guess I can't answer that question because when we tag our smolts, um, the, the smolts we, we tend to tag the smolts opportunistically on a year by year basis, and uh, the, the smolt migration typically, and um, I think Sam and Amanda would know this, typically occur over about a four week period in, in whatever system you're monitoring. And when we go in and tag our animals, um, we usually tag our animals over a period of uh, one to four days at the peak of the migration, so alongside of other individuals. So when we tag our animals, uh, we follow the movements down through the system and into the estuary, but there's no information available to say um, if they're moving alongside of untagged. We presume they're tagged, moving alongside of untagged animals, but there's no information out there to say when the untagged animals are going through specific zones. That's, that's why we do the tagging. So um, sorry, I can't answer. I don't think that information would be available. And I don't know if I understood the question, but that's how I interpreted the question, sorry. Uh, so his second question is, do you think tagging increased the ric their risk of predation? Yeah, and that we, we don't know. I would think um, th that's one of the, the questions that, that needs, really needs to be addressed when you're doing telemetry studies. Um, the, if, for instance, are tagged animals representing what untagged animals the movement patterns of untagged animals. We believe uh, one way of, of getting getting to that question, at least in the trends of what the untagged animals would be, is developing these long-term data sets, which we have here like from 2003 to 2016, because through time we can look at the trends and uh, perhaps look at some adjustment factor to, to to uh, come up with an estimate of what a true smolt would be because tag smolts could very well um, incur slightly more mortality than an untagged animal. We, we just don't know that. But, but by having a long-term time series, if you look at trends over time, you can probably extrapolate in, in terms of what the general trend is for the survival. One of the things that we're addressing is when it comes to tagging the animals, are uh, is surgery related surgery related effects impacting animals the size of the tags impacting animals or not and we're actually uh, developing studies and actually working on a study right now where we are assessing that um, where we're actually collecting animals uh, pre smolts in the fall of the year from the Miramichi system taking them to the hatchery tagging them in the winter and having those tags sleep until the spring so when we release those alongside of uh, the wild individ individuals in the spring, they would have fully recovered from, from their surgeries. So that's one way of getting around um, surgery related impacts. Getting around tag tags, um, we're actually looking at developing studies where we can actually use uh, different size tags, like some of the smaller V5 tags perhaps, um, against the V8 tags to, to try and um, tease out uh, whether uh, that is having any impact or not on the animals. Thank you. Uh, so Sam's final question is, how much do you think you would need to decrease the striped bass population to make a significant difference if the predators are so concentrated in one area? 
Yeah, that's the question for the managers. Um, there's, I, I have my personal opinion. I think a lot of people have different opinions on this too. Um, but what we can say from the study is that uh, the striped bass um, are having some form of an impact on out-migrating smolts because we're showing that by as high as 18%. Those are minimal estimates. They could be slightly more than that. When we do our uh, modeling of, of those estimates from that predation paper, we uh, the model um, incorporated data showing that the uh, tag actually had to be moving around in a bass for a period of a week uh, in order for it to be a predation event by a bass. So if a bass or another predator were to excrete the tag uh, less than that four to seven days, then that would not fit in the model. So uh, some studies out there show that when fish smolts are eaten by larger animals, the tags could be expelled in a matter of hours, um, one, a few hours to a day, a day and a half. So, so we're looking at minimal estimates here. So that's that's the first part. But really how that um, translates to adults coming back, I think that's one of the next questions. Um, is the amount of smolt being consumed in the Miramichi estuary actually having an impact on adults returning to the river based on this, this um, based on the predator here, we don't know that. Um, so, so to get to your question, there's 320,000 bass, spawning bass out there now. What if you knocked off 10? What if you knocked off 100,000? I, I really don't know, um, and, and that's not the purpose of why why we're doing this. I think um, the bass population needs to be um, managed in. Uh, a precautionary approach needs to be taken to the management of striped bass in the Miramichi system, really. And there's a lot of information that is still lacking when it comes to uh, how, how the bass are, basically basically the, the overall population of the bass in terms of what's going on in that system and how, how it relates on a broader scale. So that's, that's a question for the managers. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Jim McCarthy, whose affiliation is Wood PLC and UNB. Um, he asks, does the Daniels paper have a description of the model for bass versus smolt movements? I'm interested in doing something similar on smolt predation in estuaries by seals. Thinking about behavior change point analysis. Just curious if this is similar to your model. Yeah, what I would recommend is uh, for this gentleman to contact Jason, and uh, they have a discussion on that. He's, he's got the model developed, and he can uh, talk to the more intricacy details of this particular model. And He's investigated several other models as he's um, uh, developed the model that he used for this particular paper. So I think Jason would be really happy to, to talk um, about uh, his research plan, and uh, he might be able to provide some, some input on on um, the path forward. And Jason's also working on some other models right now in-house. So um, I would recommend, rather than me just trying to, to guess what he's looking at, is for him and Jason to get together. And uh, we can certainly arrange for that. Thank you. Uh, Jim has a follow-up question. He says he's sorry, but he missed the first part of the presentation. He had a bit of difficulty connecting um, and wants to know, did you find many tagged fish using the Grand Banks area? Um, many tag fish using or in the Grand Banks area? I think he mean I think he means in. Yeah. Um, no, none of our the information I shared today is nothing's from the Grand Banks area. We don't have receivers there. My understanding is there may be some uh, receiver arrays um, going in that area um, through the ocean tracking network, but to my knowledge, there's nothing out there right now, and. Um, I don't think any of the fish we tagged in the Gulf of St. Lawrence would have been down in that area. Um, if they were, the tags most likely would have been expired by that time. Um, but again, we through the study we had and, and the information we were using from other, other uh, institutions, nothing from the Grand Banks. Thank you. Um, our next question, and I'm afraid this will be have to be our last one as we're running out of time, uh, is from Krista Loglin, who is uh, with DFO, um, who asks, what methods were used to capture smolts? What was the most effective? And were they captured in the river prior to entering the river? And entering the estuary, excuse me. 
Yeah. Yeah, they were all captured prior to entering the estuary. Most cases uh, through the years, we used uh, smoke wheels. And again, I, I use the term we loosely because many partners were involved. Uh, Fisheries and Oceans, the watershed groups uh, primarily operated those wheels. So smoke wheels is a common name. Rotary screw traps is, is the uh, more official name for, for those units. And those units were distributed. Uh, like I mentioned, we've got four different uh, rivers where we did our studies. Uh, the closest one to the head of tide was um, about 10 kilometers above the estuary and the greatest distance was about 130 kilometers above the estuary. So they were all uh, tagged and collected in the freshwater. We, we did use uh, 